In early 2024, China is facing a widespread recession characterized by a decline in exports, sluggish domestic demand, decreased manufacturing output and sales, a struggling real estate sector, and various setbacks in service industries. Despite reports of a bustling consumer market during the Chinese New Year holiday, there are signs of false prosperity. Overcapacity issues plague the economy, including excessive production capacity, financial capital, and the number of businesses. An article titled The Great Depression is Coming, The Historical Moment of Shanghaization from Voice of America highlights the atmosphere of impending crisis in China, with businesses closing down and bosses fleeing the country becoming commonplace. The economy is on the brink of a significant downturn, prompting concerns among the Chinese population. This mall is eerily quiet. The decoration is beautiful, immaculate, but you can't see a single customer. It's already noon, and it's all just bubbles. Hello, if you have work at home, don't go around this year. Wages in Zhujiang, Guangdong, Fujian, Shandong, Beijing, Shanghai, and Tianjin are all poor, especially in Zhujiang this year, everyone is running to Zhujiang, pushing wages there to rock bottom. General workers make just over 4,000 US dollars without meals and accommodation. Today, it's not about how hard you work in business. It's already beyond the point where hard work matters. Even if you work hard, you can't do anything. Doubts about life still arise even when you work hard because there are literally no people on the streets. The underground is surprisingly clean, cleaner than dogs licking. Today we are at this Shanghai Expo. Take a look, it's bustling, but there are only a few exhibition halls, just this one hall number three, and it's only half full. If it were in previous years, all three or four exhibition halls would be full of doors and windows. Look at this year, there's only one exhibition hall, and only half of it is open. Business in physical stores is really struggling. Take a look over there and over there, there are more sellers than buyers. Who cares about doing it, I can't continue. I'm preparing to announce bankruptcy. I was live streaming here until after 11 p.m. last night, thanks to the fans for their support, sold a bunch, anyway, just while sharing, can't continue, people say you must have a better way out, I say I really don't, I'm telling you, anyway, this clothing, whoever wants to do it, let them do it, I'm not doing it anymore, I'm done, I'm really done, I'm preparing to switch lanes. Oh, I'll continue later, as long as I don't need the goods, I really can't continue. Today we will highlight issues unique to China. China is infamous for its poorly constructed projects, often dubbed as tofu drag projects. Despite Xi Jinping initiating an anti-corruption drive upon assuming office in late 2012, nearly 10 years have elapsed with minimal enhancement in construction standards nationwide. Even major projects under strict supervision lack adequate quality control, let alone smaller housing developments, leaving the public at risk and without adequate protection. The ceiling collapse incident at Gulo Hospital in Nanjing occurred on the afternoon of November 6, 2023. On that day, a video circulated online showing the sudden collapse of the ceiling on the fourth floor of the hospital's outpatient building, creating a shocking scene. In the video, hospital staff can be seen shouting and inquiring if anyone is trapped under the fallen ceiling while urging patients and their families to leave the danger zone. Numerous onlookers also appear in the video. According to publicly available information, Gulo Hospital in Nanjing, also known as the affiliated Drum Tower Hospital of Nanjing Medical University, is one of China's earliest Western hospitals and is a grade a tertiary hospital. The hospital has been repeatedly commended by the Central Civilization Commission, Jiangsu Province, and Nanjing City as an advanced collective in the national creation of a civilized industry and a civilized unit, receiving various honorary titles from the National Health Commission. The ceiling collapse incident occurred on the fourth floor of the hospital's outpatient building, which houses the obstetrics and gynecology department and the gastrointestinal endoscopy department. Currently, it is unclear whether departments such as obstetrics and gynecology are able to operate normally, but according to hospital staff, the network is in a paralyzed state. The ceiling collapse incident exposes vulnerabilities in the hospital's safety management system, raising questions about the safety of hospital facilities. Many are concerned about the possibility of similar accidents recurring, 
prompting a focus on the safety of public buildings. It also prompts people to consider how to enhance the safety of public building structures, strengthen daily maintenance and supervision, and ensure the safety of lives and property. Woman breaks stone guardrail, or shoddy construction again. On October 29, in Jiayang, Guangdong, a middle-aged woman was injured when a stone guardrail she was stretching by the river suddenly broke into several pieces. Officials' response to this incident stated, The guardrail's breakage is not due to engineering quality issues, but rather an accident caused by the excessive force used by the resident. The netizen who posted the video claimed that the woman suffered two broken bones. The video of the woman breaking the stone guardrail barehanded sparked attention, and netizens discussed whether it was due to the woman's excessive strength or the poor quality of the guardrail. Some said, is the woman naturally super strong or is it a substandard project? Others questioned, is it shoddy construction or superhuman strength? This is not the fault of the elderly woman, but rather due to the poor quality of public facilities, it suggested that it's a substandard construction. A person could easily break it. This is obviously a case of cutting corners and just sticking stones together, and they'll weather and fall off in a few years. Then they'll have to be redone to make money. On November 12, near Zongsin Elementary School, in Kiarutu Town, Yongjia County, Wenzhou City, Zhejiang Province, a four-story residential building undergoing renovation suddenly collapsed, burying four construction workers. It was known that all four individuals tragically lost their lives. Residents near the incident site revealed that the collapsed building was undergoing renovation at the time, with several construction workers inside. Unfortunately, they were unable to escape in time, and many were trapped inside the building. The official announcement from Yangjia County stated that a residential building in the process of renovation collapsed in Yantu Lane, Kiaotu Town, Yangjia County. Four individuals were trapped, and by 2 a.m. on the 12th, three of the trapped individuals were found, all of whom had unfortunately passed away. Xinhua News and Kaxin reported that as of 7 a.m. on the 12th, all four trapped individuals had shown no signs of life, confirming that they had all perished. On a fateful day, November 6, in the heart of Huanan County, within Jiamusi City of Hailongjiang Province, a chilling catastrophe struck as the roof of a sports arena came crashing down, claiming the lives of three individuals and leaving two others in agony. This duty officer mentioned that they weren't authorized to disclose information regarding the incident and suggested the reporter get in touch with the county's propaganda department. Regrettably, repeated attempts to reach the Huanan County Propaganda Department went unanswered. Notably, the Yuecheng Sports Club is an integral part of the Yuet Cheng Plaza, a flagship investment project of the county government. The collapsed gymnasium was part of the first phase of the Yuet Cheng Plaza urban complex project. The Yuet Cheng Plaza project covers a total area of 35,163 square meters and started construction in July 2017, boasting an investment exceeding 400 million yuan with multifaceted features encompassing shopping centers, recreational amenities, and residential quarters. Xinyu News Agency reported that Building 7 within the complex, housing the Yuet Chang Sports Club, spanned an impressive 3,208.96 square meters, with a towering height of 9.5 meters. This structure successfully passed construction acceptance in July 2020. The eastern section comprised a two-story construction featuring a robust concrete roof. In contrast, the western section, which tragically crumbled covering an area of 675 square meters, featured an H-shaped cross-section steel beam roof structure. Since December 2022, the management of this sports center fell under the purview of Zing Yang Guang Fitness Club in Huanan County, primarily dedicated to hosting basketball, table tennis, and badminton activities. This tragic event sent shockwaves through the region, reminiscent of a similar calamity just three months earlier. In July, the northeastern province of Heilongjiang witnessed the horrifying collapse of a school gymnasium in Kikihar, 
where a coach and 10 female volleyball players met their untimely demise. In the case of the Kiki Har Gymnasium, it was attributed to the ill-advised storage of perlite on the roof, which soaked up rainwater, ultimately causing the structure to buckle under the weight. Some may philosophize that every snowflake bears guilt in this tragedy, implying that even nature played a role. However, astute observers point to grave concerns about the overall quality of construction in China's booming industry. If the authorities fail to take swift and decisive action to rectify these quality issues, it is feared that more innocent lives may be tragically lost. I don't want to talk about anything right now. I'm just looking at the final results of the paper investigation, said the family members of the victims of the collapsed roof accident at Yue Ching Sports Club in Huayanan County, Jiamusi City, Heilongjiang Province, to Jiamian News on November 10, 2023. Currently, the families of the three deceased high school students are still gathering at the funeral home to visit their children. After the accident, the developer of the building, Heilongjiang Yuxing Real Estate Development Limited Company, immediately came to the forefront. The Tianyansha app shows that the legal representative of the company is Wu Liqiang. The number of employees in Wu Liqiang's real estate development company was not large, all family members. The company did not have the corresponding qualification for construction engineering construction. The usual practice was to be affiliated with another qualified company. According to a 2019 judgment from the People's Court website, the Yijing Shengxi community was developed and constructed by Yang Jinli in 2012 through a company named Xinlong Real Estate. Yang Jinli did not have the corresponding qualification for construction engineering construction. The development of the Yue Cheng Plaza project allowed Wu Liqian to make a lot of money on his books. The Tianyancha app shows that in 2018, Yu Cheng real estate's revenue was zero yuan. By 2019, the revenue of this company, with only 15 people, reached 141.7 million yuan. In the same year, the relevant part of the Yue Cheng Plaza complex was completed. By 2020, Yue Cheng real estate's revenue although significantly reduced, was still 69.25 million yuan, and in 2021 it dropped to 12 million yuan. Calculated this way, Yusheng Real Estate's total revenue for three years reached 222.72 million yuan. However, strangely, Yusheng Real Estate was officially deregistered on May 11, 2022. For unknown reasons, the burning question on everyone's mind remains, are these roof collapses the result of shoddy, subpar construction practices, infamously known as Tofu Dreg projects, or is Mother Nature solely to blame, unleashing her fury in the form of heavy snowfall? It's important to note that sports facilities like these are held to stringent safety standards, far beyond those of regular civilian structures. In times of crisis, the public instinctively seeks refuge in these buildings. The irony here lies in the fact that the arena's surrounding walls appeared to be secure, yet no one could have foreseen the relentless snowfall and its dire consequences. Nature's wrath often defies human control. This suggests that some deaths are tragically unavoidable, occurring suddenly and randomly. However, the stark reality within these sports complexes is quite the opposite. When they collapse, the deafening roar is akin to an earthquake or a violent explosion. As the influence of Chinese construction projects associated with the Belt and Road Initiative expands globally, Nepal's airport, funded and built by a Chinese state-owned enterprise group, is facing scrutiny due to concerns about subpar quality. The Belt and Road Initiative, led by the Chinese Communist Party, serves as a diplomatic tool amid heightened tensions with the United States. However, the substantial debt incurred by partner countries is exacerbating economic challenges. The Pika International Airport in Nepal, established by a Chinese state-owned enterprise, commenced operations in January of this year. A New York Times report alleges poor quality, suggesting that the Chinese company may have inflated the project cost. Nepal has launched an investigation into potential corruption issues, according to a CNA report. Citing the New York Times on the 12th, 
As developing nations assess the ramifications of significant borrowing from China for major infrastructure endeavors, anti-corruption officials in Nepal are scrutinizing the flagship airport financed and constructed by Chinese state-owned enterprises. The international airport in Pakura, Nepal's second-largest city, with a construction cost of $216 million, began operations in January but has struggled to attract regular international flights. Concerns have arisen about its ability to generate adequate revenue to repay loans from Chinese lenders. The police officials have sought Beijing's assistance in converting the loan into a grant to alleviate the financial strain. But the Chinese government has not acquiesced. Publicly available information from China indicates that the Paka International Airport was constructed by China's CC Engineering Company Limited a subsidiary of the state-owned China National Machinery Industry Corporation. The project commenced in 2017, with the Chinese side emphasizing it as a showcase of Chinese engineering quality, symbolizing Nepal's national pride and exemplifying China-Nepal cooperation in the Belt and Road Initiative. Previous reports from the New York Times suggested that China CC Engineering Company Limited inflated the project cost, prioritizing its own commercial interests. Subsequent to this revelation, anti-corruption units in Nepal conducted raids on the offices of the Civil Aviation Authority in Pakura, seizing documents related to the project. Although Nepal's anti-corruption agency states that the investigation is in its early stages, there are indications of receiving over 20 complaints about the airport's quality. Insiders familiar with the investigation have conveyed engineers' concerns about compromised construction quality and insufficient infrastructure. Beneath the surface of diplomatic achievements and profitable ventures for Chinese state-owned enterprises lies a disconcerting reality. This costly airport, primarily built by a Chinese company with funding from Beijing, poses a substantial economic burden on Nepal, burdening the country with debt from Chinese financial institutions for years to come. Uzualai, a political commentator and independent scholar residing in California, told Voice of America that this is the second public building collapse to occur in the northeastern region of China. This should not be attributed solely to heavy snowfall because if that were the case, we would see many buildings collapsing due to heavy snow. Therefore, heavy snowfall cannot explain the root cause. The only reason is the quality of public buildings, which were constructed 10 or 20 years ago with substandard materials and workmanship. Wu Zualai pointed out that behind the use of substandard materials lies a significant amount of corruption and kickbacks in the construction industry. He explained that construction firms have no profit unless they use substandard materials. If construction firms have government connections, they can obtain approval for engineering testing, supervision, and inspections, which makes it difficult to ensure the quality of construction. This China watcher highlighted that the negative aspects of China's decades-long reform and opening up are now becoming apparent. The Huanan Jayamusi Gymnasium collapse is not an isolated incident. And in the future, under external factors such as strong winds, snowstorms, and minor earthquakes, there may be a continuous occurrence of public and civilian building collapses. China is grappling with a pervasive and pressing issue known as Tufu Dregs Constructions, a term that aptly describes the substandard quality of various infrastructure projects across the nation, ranging from residential apartments and bridges to subways and roads. This alarming trend has ignited concerns among Chinese citizens who now live in constant apprehension of potential collapses and safety hazards lurking in their daily lives. The deteriorating state of China's infrastructure, marked by the widespread prevalence of tofu tree construction, is a grim reflection of the flip side of the country's remarkable development and modernization. It has reached such an alarming level that some have likened the situation to an apocalyptic scenario, emphasizing the severity of the impact these projects have on people's safety and well-being. While China's ability to bypass regulations and cut corners in construction allows for the expedited completion of infrastructure projects compared to their Western counterparts, this expediency comes at a significant cost. Safety and quality are often compromised in the process, putting the lives of millions at risk. Moreover, the construction of massive infrastructure projects in China, many of which remain unused or underutilized, has led to an alarming increase in CO2 emissions 
and the generation of colossal amounts of waste materials. This not only exacerbates environmental pollution, but also contributes to the degradation of the nation's fragile ecosystems. In essence, the Chinese Communist Party's inclination to prioritize saving faces face over saving lives has hindered the timely dissemination of crucial information during critical emergencies. This unfortunate reality underscores the urgent need for reforms in the construction industry and a re-evaluation of the nation's development priorities to ensure the safety and well-being of its citizens. The deserted villa complex situated atop a secluded mountain has earned the unenviable nickname Chongqing's ghost town among cautious residents. More than 100 similar, rundown villas, reminiscent of traditional Chinese architecture, stand as a stark reminder of ambitious endeavors left to decay for over 10 years. Aerial perspectives depict the complex's eerie resemblance to an abandoned cemetery, intensifying its desolate atmosphere. Dotting the landscape across China are hundreds of ghost cities and towns, massive, newly built urban areas that remain almost entirely uninhabited. The abandoned villa complex perched precariously on a remote mountaintop has rightfully earned the dubious title of Chongqing's ghost town from wary locals. Over a hundred identical, dilapidated Chinese-style villas stand as a haunting monument to hubristic human ambition, having been completely deserted for over a decade in varying states of decay. Aerial views reveal the complex's striking resemblance to a neglected graveyard, amplifying its abandoned vibe developer had delusional aspirations of creating Chongqing's most exclusive, rich enclave, promising 51 lavish villas catering to the city's elite. Grandiose plans included sprawling estates with extravagant furnishings, picturesque mountain views, and even private elevators fit for royalty. However, the impractical mountaintop location, far from the city and completely lacking infrastructure, proved the fatal flaw in this outrageous pipe dream. Shoddy construction quality and lack of paved roads, running water, electricity, and even basic plastered walls leave the villas entirely uninhabitable. The so-called luxury amenities are nowhere to be found. Years of neglect have allowed vegetation to run rampant, transforming the already eerie complex into an outright den of shadows and spirits. Vines crawl up walls while weeds force their way through cracks in the concrete foundations, reclaiming the land for nature. Rumors speculate that unresolved land rights issues on the mountain caused the desertion, as the developer likely failed to secure legal ownership of the entire area before construction started. Others suggest the developer's powerful backers withdrew support once the impracticalities of the project became clear, dooming it to rot on the mountainside. In any case, legal issues, lack of infrastructure, poor planning, and unrealistic ambitions created the perfect storm of failure. While originally valued at up to $1 million each when marketed, the dilapidated villas could now be given away for free, and no one would dare live there in their current hazardous condition. The deserted ghost town serves as a cautionary tale, representing the misguided hubris and unrealistic ambitions that often led development projects astray. No matter how well-intentioned or lavishly financed on paper, the decaying complex provokes equal parts intrigue, pity, and relief that such a preposterous project was abandoned before completion. As vines and weeds slowly reclaim the crumbling ruins, one cannot help but contemplate the eternal struggle between man's audacity and nature's steady, inevitable power. The ghost town serves as a haunting reminder to temper ambition with pragmatism, lest our lofty goals literally collapse into rubble when confronted with reality wave of new cities planned across China. Over the past two decades, China has experienced an unprecedented urban construction boom that has astonished the world in its sheer scale and rapid pace. According to a comprehensive 2016 report, local governments across China have mapped out and planned hundreds of completely new cities on a level unmatched globally in modern history. The report revealed that China's 12 provincial capitals had each planned around 4.6 new cities on average within their jurisdictions. Concurrently, 144 prefecture-level cities had blueprinted approximately 1.5 new urban areas per city. Given China's sprawling administrative structure, encompassing nearly 300 prefecture-level divisions, 
This implies plans for a staggering 400-plus entirely new city projects just among mid-tier population centers. The northeastern city of Shenyang exemplifies the oversized ambitions underlying this new city fever, with proposals for no less than 19 brand new cities within its metropolitan area alone as of 2016. Nationwide, over 3,500 new urban development zones were in various stages of pipeline planning, bidding, and construction across all provinces. Of course, this mass urbanization doesn't necessarily bring good as Wen Tai Yun, a professor at Renmin University of China and an expert on rural development and agriculture. If China's urbanization rate really exceeds 50 percent, then I think this is a very dangerous trend. Why? Because with 1.4 billion people, if 700 million move to cities, you have the world's largest urbanization on a massive scale. In cities around the world, we see all kinds of tensions. If you put such a huge population in an urban environment full of tension, although it may spur economic growth, it will actually have very serious negative effects on society. Moreover, the resources and energy it requires, as well as the unprecedented damage to the environment and ecology, are extraordinary historically unprecedented. If something happens, like energy disruptions, resources not keeping up, or food supplies lagging, it would be dangerous for a society totally reliant on external energy, resources, and food to sustain such a dense population. This is risky. Just look at the impact of the coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan, over 200 billion RMB in fiscal stimulus, massive nationwide support, huge amounts of supplies, it takes tremendous consumption and cost to maintain survival this way. These newly planned urban areas were projected to eventually house 3.4 billion inhabitants, nearly half of the total world population in 2016. This astounding figure reflects the remarkably optimistic assumptions made by local governments concerning future population growth, economic expansion, and massive rural to urban migration in their domains. The sheer scale and pace of engineered urbanization in China dwarfs even the rapid industrial city booms of 19th century Western nations like the United States, no other modern nation has pursued such centrally orchestrated, grandiose city building schemes with such abandon. However, in the ensuing years, lower than expected population growth and slowing GDP gains have led experts to increasingly question the rationale behind this oversupply of urban space. They warn that the aggressive overprojection of new cities will inevitably create severe inefficiency, waste, and imbalance in China's economic landscape and urbanization drive, warnings that have already been validated as many sites remain uninhabited ghost cities. Driving factors behind new city construction China's breakneck pace of new city construction over the past two decades was fueled by a toxic mix of competitive pressures and systemic governance flaws, according to urban development experts. This kind of intercity battle to aggressively build more and expand urban boundaries ever outwards faster became deeply ingrained in China's model of developmental governance. Local officials' career prospects and budget growth became directly tied to their ability to rapidly blueprint new urban projects within their domains. Also, the systemic lack of coordinated national-level oversight and planning. While central planning departments imposed relatively tight controls on land use and development within established existing cities, they took a largely hands-off approach when it came to approvals of entirely new cities. Provincial and municipal officials thus enjoyed provincial and municipal officials thus enjoyed extensive latitude from national regulators to greenlight new city projects locally. This lack of vertical oversight led to severe overprojection of actual urbanization needs, resulting in wasteful duplication of urban construction across regions. Unchecked overdevelopment spawned sprawling, empty cities. The expectation was that these expansive new cities would drive economic growth and attract significant influxes of residents. But in many cases, these goals failed to materialize. Instead, mile upon mile of empty buildings, vacant malls, bare civic squares, and darkened towers have come to define these ghost cities. This vacant new development is often coupled with declining populations in older existing cities as well, as resources shift to building new areas, compounding the problem. 
China's younger generations are increasingly reluctant to purchase homes in smaller cities, resisting immense societal pressures due to high youth unemployment rate. This youth disinclination further hampers occupancy rates. The examples abound of extremely low occupancy rates in the countless new city districts built across China over the past 15 years. Entire sprawling neighborhoods meant to someday house tens of thousands sit almost entirely empty. Over a decade after initial construction, one notorious case is a massive new coastal district containing row upon row of still vacant high-rise apartments, with reputedly only a single household living there even years later. China's failed resettlement housing projects displace rural populations in aggressive efforts to obtain land for urban expansion. Some local governments across China relocated rural villagers out of their homes with promises to rehouse them in new urban developments. However, many of these resettlement housing projects ultimately failed. Entire new cities were envisioned to resettle displaced rural populations. But construction often went unfinished due to insufficient developer funding, poor planning, and corruption. As a result, rural residents who had homes demolished were left unable to relocate to the very projects justified by their removal. For example, one massive resettlement housing zone in Liaoning Province intended for relocated villagers sat incomplete even after a decade, containing only uninhabitable partial structures. Neither original residents nor new occupants could move in. Similar stories have played out across the country. Grand government promises to improve residents' lives through urban resettlement routinely failed to materialize. Displaced rural populations were often left in limbo rather than gaining shiny new city dwellings. These failures underscore the human toll of aggressive displacement in the name of urbanization when ethical oversight, funding, and planning are lacking. In the rush to clear land for new cities, rural populations lost homes without gaining viable replacements. China's unfinished resettlement projects revealed development policies that sacrificed rural housing rights and welfare for urbanization dreams. More balanced policies are needed to ensure those displaced can truly improve their livelihoods. China's high-speed rail new cities. Grand visions unrealized across China. A major urban development strategy in recent years has been constructing entire new cities centered around high-speed rail stations. These ambitious projects aim to leverage new rail connectivity to catalyze growth and influxes of population. Officials hoped convenient access provided by China's rapidly expanding high-speed network would attract investment and new residents to these planned urban zones. However, in practice, most high-speed rail new cities have failed to garner the expected prosperity. According to urban planning experts, multiple factors have hampered development in these new districts. Poor coordination, locations far from established city cores, lack of facilities and infrastructure, and insufficient anchoring industry have all played a role. As a result, years after completion, many high-speed rail new cities remain ghost cities largely empty and underpopulated. The hype of connectivity has not translated into realized growth. Not only have they failed to attract development, but some experts suggest the convenience of rail access actually accelerated the outflow of populations from smaller cities towards larger metropolises with more opportunities. For example, Dow County's massive new vacant district, centered around a distant high-speed rail station, was intended to house 300,000 residents. But its barren streets and empty towers represent the unrealized aspirations of officials who hoped rail access alone could catalyze a thriving new city. While connectivity can assist urban growth, China's experience reveals that high-speed rail new cities often represent planning detached from demographic and economic realities. Their continued struggle highlights the need for more prudent, coordinated, and sustainable development. As one analyst explains, rail access alone cannot drive city development. Officials must pursue comprehensive planning anchored in realistic population and economic projections with coordinated housing, commercial, civic spaces, and value chains tailored to community needs. Grand visions of rail-connected urban utopias have given way to a more sober understanding of the limitations of China's high-speed rail new cities. Their unfulfilled potential underscores the complexities of engineered development and the need for balanced planning aligned with on-the-ground realities. How China's Real Estate Bubble
directly fueled its ghost city boom. Over the past two decades, China's runaway real estate bubble played a major role in fueling the mass construction of thousands of new ghost cities across the country on an unprecedented scale. As housing prices surged over 200 percent from 2005 to 2010 in major metropolises like Beijing and Shanghai, developers took on over $5 trillion worth of debt to finance the building of over 200 completely new cities and urban districts, creating a massive oversupply of housing units, detached from actual underlying market demand. By 2010, real estate investment had ballooned to account for a staggering 15% of China's total GDP, far above global norms. This era of frenzied, uncontrolled speculation led developers to hastily build entire new cities in remote rural locations and outlying areas that severely lacked adequate organic demand to support reasonable occupancy rates. Once the real estate bubble finally peaked after 2015, credit availability tightened considerably and construction of many of these risky, ambitious ghost city projects stalled out, leaving developers holding the bag with an estimated $1 trillion worth of stranded assets in the form of empty office buildings, condos, malls, and infrastructure. Statistics reveal the sobering extent of the oversupply that emerged from the real estate frenzy. By 2018, China's urban housing vacancy rate had hit an astonishing 22 percent, while estimates indicate there was over 1 billion square meters of totally vacant residential property scattered throughout China as of 2022. Rows upon rows of empty shops, apartments, office blocks, and civic buildings now litter these new cities. Economists widely explain that years of largely uncontrolled real estate speculation and unbridled development manias directly economists widely explain that years of largely uncontrolled real estate speculation and unbridled development manias directly gave rise to China's infamous ghost cities. These failed cities continue to be con as the real estate bubble inevitably deflates further. Analysts warn its hangover will continue to weigh on China's economic outlook for years to come given the vast scope of wasted assets and distortion of broader investment flows. Avoiding similarly uncontrolled speculation will be absolutely key for more balanced, sustainable urban development moving forward. In an age where authenticity and brand reputation are highly esteemed, the prevalence of counterfeit products in China poses a perplexing dilemma. Despite the substantial risks involved in their manufacture and sale, counterfeit goods command more than 65% of the market share within the country. This persistence of fake merchandise prompts important inquiries into consumer habits, market intricacies, and the wider ramifications for local and global economies. Dear friends, take a look at this. This is what happened when charging a phone at home with this product, which led to a fire in the house. This is a product promoted by Douyin. Just by charging with this item, which was purchased based on its recommendation, a fire broke out. China's fake head and shoulder. Can you read the name of the fake product? Chinese products are hilarious sometimes. In an era where authenticity and brand value hold significant prestige, the proliferation of counterfeit products in China presents a complex paradox. With counterfeit goods capturing over 65% of market circulation within the country, the allure of fake merchandise seems undeterred by the high risks associated with their production and purchase. This phenomenon raises critical questions about consumer behavior, market dynamics, and the broader implications for both local and global economies. Chinese fake Apple phones are on another level. This pineapple phone looks distinctive. Apple can never sue this brand. The right way to deal with China's copycat phone.
The Suining City Public Security Bureau has successfully cracked a major counterfeit Apple Bluetooth headphones case involving a staggering amount of 167 million yuan. This initiated a cross-province police criminal showdown spanning Guangdong and Guangxi involving three locations. The police force, swift and precise like a cheetah hunting its prey, apprehended 22 suspects, deeply hidden within the fabric of society. They dismantled a counterfeit production network as intricate as a spider's web, spread across two provinces. This included nine secret production sites for the counterfeit Apple Bluetooth headphones, three production lines operating around the clock, and eight sales outlets active both online and offline. During this operation, the police seized over 69,000 counterfeit headphones, so well-crafted they could easily be mistaken for the real thing, and 45,000 semi-finished products scattered about, silently speaking volumes about the deceitful transactions defrauding consumers. Additionally, a complete set of manufacturing tools, packaging materials sufficient for wrapping and distribution for 50,000 sets, and a vast number of components for 10,000 sets were confiscated, forming the cornerstone of this massive counterfeit empire. Understanding Consumer Psychology Behind Counterfeit Consumption The driving force behind the burgeoning counterfeit market in China is rooted in a deep-seated consumer psychology marked by contradictions. On one hand, the pursuit of a quality lifestyle and luxury brands symbolizes status and success in the rapidly evolving Chinese society. On the other hand, economic constraints place genuine luxury goods beyond the reach of the majority, creating a fertile ground for the counterfeit market to thrive. Faking popular brands like Adidas, for example, are very profitable. Nonetheless, be careful when buying China's shoes or this might happen to you. Do you know why there are so many counterfeiters in our country? Firstly, the cost for counterfeiters is too low. Secondly, the profits that counterfeiters can gain are too substantial. Thirdly, the protection for the original brands is too strong, and the law enforcement environment is too poor, otherwise, places like the west of Guangzhou Station wouldn't dare to be so blatantly open. Fourthly, there are too many similar products flowing in the market, the interest groups are too wide, and the legal regulations are too complicated. Fifth, ordinary consumers are unable to protect their rights, and the factors of capital manipulation and media creating public opinion are too significant, leading to the prevalence of fake watches or high-quality counterfeit watches of major brands in the market. For many, high-quality imitation products offer an accessible alternative to genuine luxury goods, allowing consumers to partake in the symbols of wealth and status without the associated financial burden. This duality of economic pragmatism and psychological fulfillment fuels the demand for counterfeit goods, posing significant challenges for brands and policymakers alike. In the industry, nearly 90% of the goods are counterfeit, and even professionals find it challenging to distinguish them. In this era, the most profitable business undoubtedly revolves around women's cosmetics and luxury goods, which have already emptied the purses of many girls. However, what you may not be aware of is that many people specifically purchase items from overseas that are fake. Some individuals are fully aware that these items are counterfeit but still pay high prices for them, all to satisfy their vanity. The industry of overseas purchasing, also known as Daigo, has made many people incredibly wealthy. However, some fake items are still noticeably different from genuine ones, while others have become so convincing that even industry experts struggle to differentiate. Bringing overseas products to Chinese consumers involves expenses such as taxes, shipping costs, and labor, which drive up the product prices to levels unaffordable for many ordinary consumers. China makes pants for aliens. Double fake? Sometimes, people just blatantly admit their true nature.
Fresh durian from Malaysia or use castus to insult the customer? At least use a really small durian. That would have been fine. <laughs> The Thriving Counterfeit Market in China, Economic and Cultural Dimensions At the heart of the counterfeit market in China lies significant economic drivers. The allure of high returns with comparatively low production costs presents a lucrative opportunity for counterfeiters. For instance, in the realm of footwear, the city of Putian has emerged as a notorious hub for the manufacture of fake shoes that are often indistinguishable from genuine articles. In 2020, the police in Ningbo, Zhujiang, busted a counterfeit shoe sales point, confiscating over 10,000 counterfeit and substandard goods with a total value of 3 million yuan. The individuals involved were arrested on charges of selling counterfeit registered trademark products and were subjected to criminal measures. It was reported that the goods all originated from Putian, Fujin. These counterfeit shoes were initially purchased for just a dozen or 20 yuan each, with the most expensive ones not exceeding 100 yuan. However, when resold to retailers or consumers, the prices multiplied. In the same year, Shanghai police also uncovered a counterfeit shoe production point in Putian, arresting 15 suspects, including an experienced shoemaker with 30 years of experience. The police seized over 60,000 pairs of counterfeit shoes, nearly 100,000 pairs of semi-finished products, and over 500 pieces of counterfeit equipment, with a total value of 120 million yuan. While the net of justice is wide, there are always those who manage to slip through. Initially, Putian shoes were produced in underground factories, and Putian was indeed dubbed the counterfeit shoe capital. They operated covertly, evading the watchful eyes of regulatory authorities. Middlemen played a role in facilitating the production and sales of counterfeit goods, allowing the industry to survive in the gaps. Today, these activities have transitioned to online platforms, further expanding their reach. China wants to fake everything it can get its hand on. This makes the actual companies lose billions in profit. Only in China, Adidas and Nike decided to combine and form some sort of hybrid. This is an economically powerful town in Guiping, and it is also the production base for manufacturing counterfeit Adidas, Nike and Puma brand. Moreover, the economic incentives extend beyond mere production. The counterfeit market has ingeniously adapted to the digital age, leveraging e-commerce platforms and online shopping agents to broaden their reach. By manipulating logistics and shipping origins, counterfeiters enhance customer trust and obscure the true nature of the products being sold, further exacerbating the challenge of curbing this illicit trade. The advent of counterfeit malls and fake shopping services demonstrates the lengths to which counterfeiters will go to mimic legitimacy and tap into the lucrative market of consumers looking for high-end products at a fraction of the cost. What is this? Obama's fried potato? And the brand is UFO? Only in China can they produce this level of product. Another knockoff brand in China. The counterfeit market in China is not solely the result of opportunistic manufacturers, it also reflects a nuanced cultural landscape where the demand for affordable goods often overshadows the quest for authenticity. A significant portion of the Chinese population, grappling with low income, gravitates towards these cheaper alternatives. The high cost of genuine products, coupled with a societal emphasis on external appearances and brand recognition, fosters a fertile ground for counterfeits. Consumers, motivated by the desire to participate in the prestige associated with branded goods without the financial burden, willingly engage with the counterfeit market. I bought toothpaste, and it's particularly difficult to use. Today, when I examined it closely, I realized that it's a Yunnan traditional Chinese medicine product. You can see how much it resembles Yunnan by Yao. I've already used so much of it, and it's not effective at all. At least it is really cheap. Here is a netizen explains why fake Red Bull is so cheap. First, 
Let's compare the packaging. The genuine and imitation packaging are very similar. However, there are some differences, like the bull logo, right? Also, their letters are different. The genuine one is red bi, while the imitation is rebuii. The D becomes B, and the I is lowercase in the imitation, whereas it's uppercase in the genuine one. The text is also different. The genuine one says Red Bull, while the imitation says Energy Drink. But their capacities are the same, both 250 milliliters, and the text below is somewhat similar. One is Red Bull Vitamin Functional Beverage, and the other is Red Bull Vitamin Tianjin Food Limited Company. Next, let's compare the most important part, their ingredients, and see what's different. Let's first look at the ingredient list for the imitation. The first ingredient is water, followed by white sugar, fruit syrup, concentrated apple juice, and seven food additives. Then, there's edible essence, vitamin B6, and vitamin B12. This vitamin is listed after the essence, and it's conceptually added because food safety regulations clearly specify that the amount of essence added is very small. So, it's conceptually added. Now, let's look at the genuine one. The genuine ingredient list has taurine, lysine, inositol, caffeine, niacin, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, citric acid, white sugar, essence, sodium citrate, sodium benzoate, lemon yellow, and cochineal. Notice that it doesn't include red water. It's evident that the genuine product has more ingredients than the imitation. So, we've found the reason why the imitation is sold so cheap. It's because the quality of the ingredients used is significantly lower than the genuine product. It's all about cutting costs. The counterfeit goods market in China, with its sprawling inventory of imitations ranging from high-profile brands like Nike, Adidas, and Red Bull to the audacious cloning of foreign malls, casts a long, dark shadow over the intricate fabric of societal values and ethical norms. This shadow not only obscures the line between authenticity and forgery but also deeply stains the societal perception of value, quality, and the price we are willing to pay not just monetarily, but morally. As counterfeit goods flood the market, they erode the bedrock of trust and integrity, compelling us to confront uncomfortable truths about our consumption habits and the ethical compromises we entertain for the sake of economy and convenience. What in China can't be counterfeited? From our food, clothing, and everyday items to pots, pans, and utensils, as long as there's money to be made, counterfeit goods are rampant. Does this include e-commerce, which is currently booming? Have you ever noticed that on e-commerce platforms, you can often find items priced so low that you can't even imagine and they still offer free shipping? Items like these are essentially industrial waste, meant to be discarded, but they are used to deceive consumers, undermining trust. I have to ask, where is our sense of responsibility? Where is our integrity? Even when it comes to something like engine oil, there are counterfeit products out there. For instance, well-known brand engine oil is sold online for over 100 yuan, while there are others selling it for 4 to 500 yuan. Is the profit margin really that huge? In our live broadcasts, we often encounter car owners who use fake engine oil or the wrong type, leading to engine damage. Ordinary people work hard to save money to buy a car, only to be forced to spend thousands of yuan on major engine repairs due to the actions of unscrupulous businesses. When will this end? In recent years, unethical Chinese vendors have been devising new methods of fraud and deceit to make substantial profits. Let's explore some of these deceptive tactics used for financial gain. It's bound to be enlightening and may challenge your perceptions. However, it's important to emphasize that our purpose is solely to uncover these fraudulent practices in the industry and provide guidance on how to identify them. Please do not imitate these practices. In front of me lies half a duck, deceitfully passed off as lamb. Today, I'll expose how deceitful vendors in barbecue shops use duck meat to mimic lamb skewers. Start by preparing half a frozen duck and a bit of lamb tail oil. Then, remove the duck skin with a knife and slice the meat into small pieces. Next, 
Cut the lamb tail oil into similar sized pieces and mix them together in a bowl. Add ginger slices to remove any gaminess, followed by salt for seasoning and lamb marinade. Add two drops of lamb essence using a straw, being careful not to overdo it. With these ingredients, the duck meat transforms into lamb, even mimicking its flavor. Mix in some egg white thoroughly. Skip the compound phosphate for moisture retention and add cumin powder instead. Let it marinate for 30 minutes. Skewer the meat according to the ratio of 3 times meat to 2 times fat. Brush with oil and grill or bake at 220 degrees for 15 minutes. The skewers are nearly ready. In recent years, Unethical Chinese vendors have been devising new methods of fraud and deceit to make substantial profits. Today, let's explore some of these deceptive tactics used for financial gain. It's bound to be enlightening and may challenge your perceptions. However, it's important to emphasize that our purpose is solely to uncover these fraudulent practices in the industry and provide guidance on how to identify them. Please do not imitate these practices. Fake Lamb a previous viral video shared online by a restaurant owner confidently demonstrates how to counterfeit lamb meat using duck, a not uncommon practice in China. Widespread existence of counterfeit products in China is a glaring reality, and amidst this disturbing trend, the pervasiveness of counterfeit food products emerges as a deeply troubling issue. The proliferation of food fraud not only poses a serious threat to public health but also fosters a pervasive atmosphere of mistrust within society. Today, let's shed light on some of the shocking instances of counterfeit food items that plague the Chinese food market, igniting justified anger and outrage. Let's begin with the fake lamb that you saw at the beginning of the video. How do they produce counterfeit lamb jerky? When it comes to meat, the prevalence of fake lamb in counterfeit lamb chops has become a major concern for consumers in recent times. At a lamb processing facility, reporters had to clandestinely document the utterly appalling lack of hygiene. What they uncovered was beyond shocking, fresh cuts of meat carelessly mixed with putrid, decomposing scraps, some so repulsive they wouldn't even be fit for feeding to animals, let alone humans. This flagrant disregard for basic sanitation standards is not just infuriating, it's an outright betrayal of trust. Consumers rightfully expect food to be safe and uncontaminated, yet these images expose a callous disregard for public health and safety that is utterly reprehensible. During the meat processing stage, Lamb is sorted based on its various cuts and then distributed into the market after undergoing inspections. However, certain businesses, in a bid to save costs, resort to blending low-quality or even spoiled meat with chemical additives like flavorings during processing. In terms of taste and appearance, these fraudulent lamb chops closely mimic the real ones, making it nearly impossible to distinguish between them. Some unscrupulous businesses utilize an enzyme as a binding agent, blending duck and chicken meat with beef along with the appropriate seasoning to create counterfeit lamb chops, further adding to the outrage of consumers. Fake Beef The deceitful tactics employed by individuals seeking profit from counterfeit goods extend beyond lamb to include the more commonly consumed beef. Today, we're going to deceive people by using duck meat instead of beef. Let's see how this deceitful scheme unfolds. Our aim is not authenticity, so let's start by removing the duck's webbed feet. We'll season it with salt, chicken bouillon, beef bouillon, five-spice seasoning, and a touch of concentrated beef broth for an illusion of authenticity. The beef flavor might be too overpowering, so let's throw in some yeast extract for an extra kick. Adding a bit of beef powder should intensify the deception. And of course, let's not forget the preservatives, just in case we can't sell it all today and need it to last longer on the shelves. A few extra drops should do the trick. Mix everything thoroughly in this shameful act of deception. Shocking footage has surfaced revealing the production process of fake beef using plastic in factories, sparking outrage among consumers in China. Report exposes the shocking use of plastic in factories to produce fake beef in China, sparking widespread outrage. Unethical vendors have been caught blending plastic with meat to increase profits, jeopardizing public health. This disturbing revelation underscores the urgent need for stricter food safety regulations and greater oversight in the industry. Would you dare to consume such hazardous meat? As beef prices skyrocket, businesses are turning to cheaper alternatives like chicken, duck, or pork to create synthetic meat, flavored with additives to mimic beef. Today, I'll expose how some unethical eateries substitute duck meat to fake genuine beef. This concoction is essentially processed duck meat with additives like water-retaining agents. Dubious businesses even mix this duck meat with beef essence to pass it off as authentic beef. After thorough mixing and adding starch, we fry the duck meat until cooked, then set it aside. Next. We stir-fry it with peppers, chicken stock, MSG, black pepper sauce, and a hint of soy sauce. This results in a dish resembling beef, but the discerning eye can spot the differences. 
Genuine beef has a denser texture and chewier consistency, unlike this softer, slipperier duck meat. So, be cautious when dining out and watch out for counterfeit beef dishes. Some manufacturers go to great lengths to replicate the surface texture of beef, making it virtually indistinguishable from authentic beef. They utilize leftover beef scraps, mix them with additives, and create synthetic mincemeat that resembles genuine minced beef. Some even use meat from diseased animals or aged sows to cut costs. Coloring agents are added to replicate the appearance of fresh beef, and some even use eggs, starch, or plant protein to create a fake composite meat that looks and feels like real beef. The prevalence of counterfeit beef is concerning, especially when consumers may unknowingly consume it in dishes like boiled or stir-fried beef at restaurants. Let's delve deeper into a prevalent counterfeit beef variety that has infiltrated the restaurant scene for over a decade, Mongolian meat. Despite its name, Mongolian meat doesn't actually contain any beef. It's often mistaken for Mongolian beef, but the truth is far from it. On September 9, 2023, a scandal rocked Inner Mongolia University, the sole 211 university in the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region. The university canteen was exposed for substituting duck meat in place of beef and lamb, resulting in a hefty fine of 270,000 yuan. Following public outcry, the Market Supervision Administration of Yuchuan District, Hohot, Inner Mongolia, took action on September 4, issuing an administrative penalty notice regarding the use of duck meat instead of beef and lamb in the East Campus Canteen of Inner Mongolia University South Campus. The investigation revealed a turnover of 16,374 yuan from the stall substituting duck meat. As a consequence, the authorities confiscated the illegal earnings and imposed a hefty fine of 270,000 yuan. According to reports from the paper, lamb rolls blended with pork and duck meat are a common occurrence. These rolls, along with beef rolls containing duck meat, are widely available on various e-commerce platforms, often advertised for hot pot, barbecue, and buffet restaurant use. Additionally, there are mixed meat rolls made by assembling meat chunks and adding water for tenderness. Prices for lamb and beef rolls mixed with duck meat range from 7 to 15 yuan per kilogram, while mixed meat rolls are priced between 12 and 30 yuan per kilogram. Pure lamb rolls typically cost between 45 and 60 yuan per kilogram. Given the high selling price of lamb at Super Island Hot Pot, the profit margin is significant. With their adeptness at deception, Chinese traders have made counterfeit products virtually identical to genuine ones, making them difficult to discern. Fake Rice Next, a staple food of China, plain rice. Have you ever witnessed the horrifying production process of plastic rice? Picture this, streams of white plastic endlessly fed into a machine, churning out dough-like substances from the other end. The dough is then processed through wire drawing and threading machines, magically transforming into shiny plastic rice. It's a similar scene in this video, some mysterious gel-like substance poured in, and out comes what appears to be rice. Even the trendy self-heating rice products aren't safe from deception. While the rice in supermarkets boasts clarity and distinct grains, the rice in these meals resembles long, thread-like strands with tiny bubbles inside, hardly resembling real rice. What's being sold is essentially reconstituted rice, made from a mishmash of rice, wheat, and cornstarch, loaded with seasonings and additives. Despite its rice-like appearance, it's nutritionally lacking due to the production process, making it unfit for long-term consumption. Adding to the deception is the rise of natural green rice, supposedly a northeastern Chinese specialty. However, many locals only learned about it recently. Despite claims of being free from colorants and additives, reviews reveal a different story. Ingredients like cornflour, spinach, flour, mulberry leaf powder, fresh bamboo leaf powder, and water dominate the list, everything but rice. Cooked, it looks fresh but fades in color, sticking together like glue and offering a texture akin to chewing on glue. It's a far cry from nutritious food, more like a dental hazard. Fake wine and beer. Even beverages cannot escape the ambition to profit from fake beer, wine, both domestic and imported. Counterfeit liquor counterfeit liquor is rampant in China, particularly wine, which is a rampant issue, especially with expensive imported varieties being the most common targets. Dishonest traders not only swap up genuine products for inferior ones, but also resort to using their own low-quality wines to mimic high-end imports. The video below illustrates their deceitful methods in detail, showcasing just how far they go to produce these fake beverages. Have you ever been fooled by this kind of XO liquor? Today, I'll reveal the secret of how plain water turns into XO. 
This is a tub of plain water. First, pour in the seasoning according to the proportion of alcohol content. Adding alcohol can generate the aroma of wine and the desired alcohol content. Then, add food coloring to the water, and instantly it turns into the color of XO. But where does the taste of XO come from? We symbolically add some bulk brandy to season it, and that's how a tub of 7,000 milliliters of XO is blended. And yet, the cost is less than 5 yuan. Beverages infused with the essence of life. Quite similar. Continue adjusting the champagne props. Done. Bright color, the liquor is cloudy. Below, seems a bit lacking. Perfect. In recent years, many Chinese businessmen have shown great interest in investing in foreign wineries, and many of these small wineries have turned into channels for counterfeit alcohol. Yet its cost is only half or even a third of the authentic counterparts. Why do so many barbecue and seafood buffet spots provide unlimited draft beer? Today, I'll uncover the process behind this cheap bulk beer, costing less than a cent. It's simple, just four steps. First, fill a basin with water. Then, add two spoonfuls of malt powder and mix evenly. Notice the beer's color now? Step two, add some alcohol for flavor. Just a little, we don't want to get drunk. Stir again. The alcohol aroma is there, but we're missing foam, the essence of beer. Add a spoonful of citric acid for zest, and another baking soda for fizz. Did you see how the foam appeared instantly? Incredible! Now the beer has color and texture, but it's missing the beer taste. Add a touch of beer essence for an immediate burst of flavor. Pour yourself a glass now. The video exposes how authentic Maudai bottles are easily replaced with counterfeits, alongside the widespread counterfeiting of high-end baiju and imported wines. Despite security measures by distilleries, counterfeiters persist, emphasizing the need for stronger anti-counterfeiting efforts. As Chinese society grapples with poison milk powder, tainted vaccines, and contaminated classrooms, it's clear that the food crisis is spiraling out of control. The government's feeble attempts at food safety regulation are nothing but empty promises, leaving citizens vulnerable to poisoning. The lack of transparency, legal loopholes, and declining social trust only compound the issue. In a regime of deception and toxicity, navigating life becomes an endless struggle for the Chinese people. Unveiling the issue of abandoned zombie cars lining the streets, understanding why owners are reluctant to dispose of their vehicles. In contemporary society, cars have emerged as the preferred mode of transportation for countless people. Unlike electric bikes and bicycles, cars provide enhanced range, comfort, and safety. Nonetheless, the operational expenses linked with cars can be substantial. As fuel prices persistently rise, many car owners are troubled by the mounting costs of refueling, which can amount to tens of thousands of yuan annually, causing discontent among a sizable portion of the population. One year, two tanks of gas, exploring the world of abandoned cars in Shenzhen. In Shenzhen, there's a phenomenon known as one year, two tanks of gas, and locals amusingly refer to it as ghostly worry. Behind me is a unique collection of what's called Guangdong zombie cars. These vehicles are only brought out during the Chinese New Year, and some are in such disrepair that attempting to drive them today might prove futile. Now, let me take you on a tour. Do you see any zombie cars around here? Next to me is a Toyota Crown. Can anyone tell me how it ended up here and what purpose it serves? Look at the state of this car, it's already in a dilapidated condition. Can you guess the model of this car? It's a Honda Xiangyu. The vehicle shows signs of damage and neglect, probably from being parked in this spot. Notice the flat tires and the puzzling decision of the owner to abandon it in this condition. Over there, you can see a BYD G3 and a Geely England. These cars, likely from the early 2000s, are surprisingly still in this location. Next to them is an Audi A4, and there's even a hybrid, the Cherry Chien. I'm puzzled right now. While we can disconnect the small battery, what about the large one? Leaving it here for a year, will it deteriorate? And look at the cherry tigo nearby, it's almost unrecognizable. The paint has peeled off, and even the metal is cracked. These seem like abandoned and scrapped cars. I'm curious about the owners, where are they? What's their rationale for leaving these cars here? Notice the cherry ruehu, completely transformed and in a deteriorated state. The paint has burst open, and even the metal sheet has cracked. These seem like scrapped cars. I wonder where the owners of these cars are. I'm also curious if selling the scrap metal could fetch a few thousand yuan. 
Moving on, there's a BYD-S7, possibly the predecessor to the Tang model. Back then, BYD didn't have plug-in hybrids with Great Wall, Geely, and Chan'an. This car has transformed from white to yellow. Here's a Chan'an Weipai VV5, one of the better looking models in the Weipai series. Unfortunately, its sales declined after a facelift. Even a Mercedes-Benz E-Class is parked here. Look at this place, it's scratched, and there's even an Audi A4. Is it worth saving a bit on parking fees? This place has been scraped clean, including an Audi A4 up front. Is it worth saving a bit on parking fees? Looking at all these cars, most are worth just over a hundred thousand yuan. This is a true reflection of our ordinary lives. In Shenzhen, there are many places without parking fees, leading to the proliferation of these abandoned cars, known as zombie cars. However, one thing I can't understand is why the owners choose not to sell these cars and opt for renting instead. Take, for example, this car. The annual insurance alone costs around 3,000 yuan. With tires in this condition, replacing them would cost about 500 yuan. Basic maintenance, which is essential, would add another 500 yuan. For a casual drive during the new year, spending 4,000 yuan to rent a better car would seem like a more sensible choice. That's without considering the depreciation of the car itself. If it were you, would you choose to rent a car or buy one and leave it like this? Yesterday, there was a fire on the mountain, and white smoke billowed. Five or six fire trucks were here for rescue. We wanted to get close to see what was happening but were stopped by staff, citing the dangerous situation. The ground was noticeably wet, possibly from the water sprayed by the fire trucks. However, some car owners hadn't moved their cars, even in such a risky situation. It's concerning to think that these cars, running on just two tanks of gas a year, could catch fire. But, part of me hopes they do catch fire, prompting a response from the fire department. As we continue walking, we see the aftermath of the fire. The cars are reduced to shells, and the tires and everything else are burnt. The owners must be devastated. Inside the cars, only a few seats remain. These cars are parked in industrial areas, and the ones inside are clean, unlike those outside resembling vehicles from a post-apocalyptic world. People may ask why these dirty cars are parked here. It's because the parking is free. Even though it's a dirty place, finding a parking space elsewhere is difficult. You might think this is a dirty place, but if you drive out and come back, there won't be any parking spaces. It's a sought-after spot, available only once a year during the spring festival. People look for these spots to park, understanding that for the rest of the year, it will be challenging to find such spaces. In less than a month, after the 20th, these dirty cars will disappear. On the way home, we won't see these dirty cars, instead, there will be clean ones. You won't be able to distinguish between the cars that only use two tanks of gas a year. When the spring festival arrives, these car owners activate their nuclear weapons, beautifying their cars and ensuring they're in top condition. They start their journey home, as for them, driving only happens during the new year. This saying is a joke about those who only use two tanks of gas a year. Some spend tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands to buy a car, only to keep it parked and spend on insurance and maintenance. It might not make financial sense, but for rural residents, having a car is essential, especially for those who have moved from the countryside. Having a car is not just about convenience, it's about dignity and societal expectations. While some argue that buying a car is not cost-effective and is a waste, these car owners are well aware of the expenses. Yet, they endure it for the sake of their own convenience, face, and societal acceptance. In rural areas, everyone must have a car, and not having one can lead to judgment. Despite the infrequent use of these cars, owning one is a necessity, and for many rural residents, it's the only way to navigate their daily lives. Exposing the phenomenon of abandoned zombie cars on the roadside, why owners hesitate to scrap their vehicles? In modern society, cars have become the preferred means of transportation for many individuals. Compared to electric bikes and bicycles, cars offer greater range, comfort, and safety. However, the operational costs of cars can be significant. With the continual increase in fuel prices, many car owners are dismayed by the expenses associated with fueling up, 
which can accumulate to tens of thousands of yuan per year, leading to dissatisfaction among numerous individuals. Nonetheless, once individuals have invested in a car, allowing it to sit idle at home is not a viable option, as it would depreciate annually, proving to be economically inefficient. However, over time, car issues begin to emerge gradually. While some minor problems can be resolved through simple repairs, major issues involving critical components such as gearbox malfunction or oil leakage may persist even after repair. For models exceeding 20 years of service, it may be time to consider scrapping them. Have you noticed the abandoned zombie cars lining the roadside? Why haven't they been taken to the vehicle management office for scrapping? Let's delve into this matter together. Firstly, vehicles approaching or surpassing the scrapping deadline cannot be disposed of by their owners. Some individuals may contemplate selling their vehicles as scrap metal after scrapping, but this constitutes illegal behavior and could result in penalties if discovered. Secondly, the process of towing scrapped cars to the vehicle management office is cumbersome. Owners must first navigate through the various departments to handle scrapping procedures. Upon completion, if all documents are in order, they receive a motor vehicle scrapping certificate, which is then submitted to the scrapping company. Obtaining this certificate is challenging as many documents and procedures may be unavailable, necessitating the printing of various documents at the owner's expense. After submission, approval may take up to a week. If documents are incomplete, multiple trips to the vehicle management office are required for resubmission, consuming both time and effort. Lastly, and most crucially, subsidies are meager. Some private cars receive subsidies of only a few hundred yuan after scrapping. Even luxury cars worth hundreds of thousands or millions of yuan may only receive subsidies of over 1,000 yuan. In contrast, selling a one-ton car as scrap metal can fetch at least 3 to 5,000 yuan, with luxury cars selling for over 10,000 yuan. Consequently, many individuals opt to abandon their scrapped cars on the roadside rather than undergo the scrapping process at the vehicle management office, a decision born out of necessity. These cars, known as zombie cars, are mainly used during the Chinese New Year and are mostly owned by rural migrant workers. They sit idle for most of the year and are only driven when the workers go home for the holidays. Even though they're hardly used, these cars lose value over time and cost money for things like loans and repairs. It's also tough to get rid of them officially because of all the paperwork, and the money you get for scrapping them isn't much. So, many owners just leave them sitting around instead. These abandoned cars come in all shapes and sizes, from regular ones to fancy ones, showing that this is a big problem. It's not just about money, it also shows issues with how cities are growing and how people get around. Automotive companies dark side the truth about multiple failures and poor quality. There are several key points regarding electric car technology, corporate policies, and infrastructure challenges. It begins with the issues encountered with the BYD E5 electric car, including faults in the steering and airbag systems, as well as malfunctions in the infotainment and air conditioning systems. Some opinions of electric cars users express concerns about safety and dissatisfaction with the inability to restart the car and the instability of the electronic systems. Next, it addresses the widespread popularity of an expensive car model called the U88 and the strict regulations imposed by some companies regarding their employees' car ownership. There exists dissatisfaction with BYD's warranty policy and indeed the lack of transparency in the limitations of the lifetime warranty. Lastly, it expresses concerns about the infrastructure for electric vehicle charging and the challenges faced when trying to charge electric cars in unfavorable conditions. My BYD E5 was running fine just now, and suddenly, I don't know what's wrong with the car. Let's zoom in on this. There are two faults, one is the interconnection system fault in the steering system, and the other is an airbag system fault. I just got this new car, and I've only driven 1064 kilometers. Now, should I keep driving, or should I stop? Can I contact BYD's official rescue service now? There's a problem, after this fault occurred, the entire infotainment system in my car crashed. I can't use any of the controls for volume or tuning on the steering wheel, I have to manually press pause. It says to reduce the speed to zero and then electrically restart. But now, I'm already at zero, brother. We haven't stopped, it shows that I've driven 32 kilometers. Can you see the situation? 
Am I driving, or am I stopped? Another issue, folks, the air conditioning is not working now. See? Now it says, please check the air conditioning system. If I were in Ulan Bader, where it's dozens of degrees below zero, wouldn't I have frozen to death by now? I want to press the start button to start the car, but I can't. It won't let me, it won't let me turn off the automatic engine shutdown. Now it's in EV mode. I switch it to HEV mode. Let's see, it still doesn't work. I've been driving for many years, and it's the first time I've encountered such a problem. If a traditional fuel car has an engine malfunction, can I just turn off the engine? Now that this problem has occurred, firstly, I dare not drive the car. Secondly, I can't turn off the engine or shut down the power. And now, look at this, the electronic accelerator pedal is not working either. The accelerator is also broken. But what's particularly interesting is that on the passenger side, it's broken, but on the driver's side, it's working fine. You see, the driver's side is fine. I can only close the door. Whether I use the start button or the key, I can't lock it. With this current problem, if I were in Ulan Bader, what would I do? Suppose I want to open the tailgate now. I want to sleep inside, but I can't. Moreover, there's no free rescue for non-paved roads. What should I do? I can only sit in the car, I have nothing to eat or drink. Can I only sit in the car and wait to die? Have you heard of it? The U88, which costs over a million, now everyone must have one, you can't avoid buying it. If you don't buy it, try it. Moreover, they don't allow their employees to drive other brands of cars, do you understand? For example, if you work for them, you must buy their cars. If you are interested in cars from other brands, they won't allow it, and you'll be fired if you buy them. Some time ago, a brother said he wanted to buy a car, and he liked a car from their brand. At that time, I told my friend, if you buy it, I will cut off ties with you, I will block you. Of course, this was a joke, and my friend listened to me. He decisively gave up and booked a Xiaoping P7. A few days ago, I visited a friend who deals with automotive parts. In the evening, when we were having dinner together, he complained while drinking that he wouldn't buy a certain brand's car. He also urged people around him not to buy it. Why? He said he felt sorry for the four words national enterprise because their company is bad. They exploit suppliers in various ways, and anyone who has cooperated with them knows it. They creatively created something like a chain. Normally, when others supply you with goods, you pay, right? It's not like that for them. It's a three-month payment period. Now it seems to have become six months. The payment is not made to you directly, but to a certain chain. This chain then has a six-month payment period. If you say your cash flow is tight and you want early payment, it's okay. There's a handling fee and points. You think, is this shameless or not? If you haven't run a business, you may not understand. Let me explain again. It's like I sign a contract with you to order a million worth of goods. I pay you a 30% advance payment for three months. Your products have all arrived in my warehouse within a week, but I won't pay you the remaining 700,000. I'll give you a 700,000 acceptance, like an IOU. If you want immediate cash, you can only discount it at a 30%, 20%, 10%, or 5% discount. Otherwise, you have to wait for six months. Think about it. How much interest will you have on this 700,000 in six months? If you're short of 700,000, do you have any money to turn around for your next big order? Here, I'm just giving a small example. If it's a million, if it's five million, think about it. Go to Don Juan and inquire about how many machining bosses are dragged to death by the payment period. Some people dare not do it anymore, and they are seriously lacking business spirit. The terms clearly stated in the contract are often subject to various additional conditions, and cleaning up accounts becomes even more difficult. BYD, you can't afford to play like this. You promised a first-round vehicle owner's lifetime warranty. Now, I bought it, drove it for 10 months, and they tell me that my lifetime warranty is gone. Let me show you inside, it says that if you drive more than 30,000 kilometers in a year, you won't enjoy the lifetime warranty. They wave the banner of a lifetime warranty and then impose many restrictions. The most annoying thing is that when buying a car, 
the salesperson doesn't tell you about these restrictions. After buying, they say that the restrictions take effect after signing a contract, and they didn't even sign a contract with me. What should I do now? Has anyone experienced the same situation as me? Get in the car. You see, the country always encourages people to buy electric cars. Buy an electric car. On the highway. Look at so many charging stations. None of them can be used. And there are only two that work. Look at so many cars queuing up here. Isn't this killing people? Don't listen to the nonsense about charging for 5 minutes in a range of 300 kilometers. Does your car support it? Does your car support charging stations? When you need the fastest charging speed, isn't it on the highway in the service area? Do you know that most of the service areas in China are supplied by the state grid? How powerful are most of the charging stations there? 60, 80, 90, and even bigger, 120 kilowatts. This was just newly installed by the state grid. Let me show you how powerful it is. 160 kilowatts, 160 kilowatts, double clearance. In fact, it's 80 kilowatts per person when two people charge. I drove from northeast China to Wuhan and charged more than 10 times, each time taking over an hour. It's not that the car is not good, it's related to the temperature and the charging station's power. If you want to be 80% full in 10 to 20 minutes at a high service area, wait a few more years.